the broad area of dramatic literature can be divided into a number of subtypes or sub genres in dramatic literature we have tragedy which is regarded as one of the noblest kind of literary genre we have comedy which were regarded by uh, the greeks as meant for common people no, not for the noble like tragedy then we have historical plays and we have the mixture of tragedy and comedy which is called tragic comedy later on we have other sub genre of dramatic literature such as one act play absurd drama kitchen sink drama so there are various types of drama dramatic literature now uh, today as this is the introductory class for macbeth we shall go into the genre of tragedy uh in detail and we shall discuss the various aspects of classical tragedy and renaissance tragedy i hope that uh, the background of the renaissance period and its uh, literature will be discussed in the class uh by some other teacher and perhaps it has already started so i am not going into the literary characteristics characteristics of the uh, renaissance period as such though i told you uh, a little bit the previous day when I, i was talking about the history of english literature now today i shall start with the development of tragedy in the uh, classical period in the in the hands of the uh, greeks and romans uh, but what is tragedy how can we define tragedy tragedy is a branch of drama that treats in a serious and dignified style the sufferings and misfortunes encountered by an by a heroic individual now uh, there are two or three points which are very important first it's a kind of dramatic literature its theme is suffering and misfortune but not of anybody but often of a heroic individual a person who is noble in stature who belongs to a high station of life and his downfall from the high to the low state is the theme of a tragedy the style must be serious and dignified the way this kind of theme should be dealt with must be serious and lofty there is a famous definition by aristotle of tragedy in his book uh, in his famous work called poetics which uh, is still now regarded as the uh, defi uh, the the definitive uh, definition of a tragedy it is uh, i mean what aristotle said in poetics is that tragedy is the imitation of an action that is serious complete and possesses magnitude in language made pleasurable each of its kind separated in different parts in form dramatic not narrative with incidents arousing pity and fear 
wherewith to accomplish the catharsis of such emotions. This is regarded as a complete definition of uh, tragedy, at least the tragedy that was in vogue in the uh, time of Aristotle, the tragedy of Sof uh, playwrights like Sophocles and uh, Euripides. Now, uh, so there are certain important points, points there. So tragedy is the imitation of an action that is serious. Imitation, now uh, there is a, a very uh, elaborate uh, definition of imitation of an action. And in Greek, it is called mimesis. Uh, it is difficult now for uh, me to go into the details of the concept called mimesis, but I'll just tell you that the Greeks, uh, the Greek philosophers, especially uh, Plato, whose uh, uh, disciple Aristotle was, regarded uh, idea as the truth. Now, according to Plato, if idea is the true uh, thing, then this life, which is the real life, which is an imitation of that idea, which is a copy of that idea, is actually one step away from the truth. And literature, which again imitates the real life, is another step away from the truth. So, literature can be called an imitation of an imitation. It's a copy of a copy. Or the shadow of the shadow. If idea is the real thing, then the first shadow is real life, the life we lead here on this earth, and its second shadow is the literature that imitates real life again. So this is the con concept of mimesis. And Aristotle says in the definition of tragedy that tragedy is the imitation of an action that is serious, complete, and possesses magnitude. So it's an action, uh, sorry, uh, it's, it's an imitation of an action of real life that must be serious. Tragedy cannot be written on the funnier or lighter sides of life. It must be serious and dignified. It must be complete. So there must be a completeness about the theme of a tragedy. The action must be complete in itself. It must have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it must possess magnitude. The action that is being imitated in a tragedy must possess magnitude. That means it must have a considerable length. In language made pleasurable, uh, it must have it must be treated in a language that have pleasurable accessories like uh, the different ornaments of the language, rhetorics, its kinds separated in different parts. So there must be uh, uh, the different aspects, the different uh, parts must be separated in form, it is dramatic, it is not narrative. Dramatic means, I told you the previous day, that the action should be revealed by means of dialogue and uh, the character analysis. The revelation of character must be through the dialogue spoken by the 
characters. They can be monologues also. The monologues in a drama are called soliloquies. So it cannot be narrative mode. It's not that somebody is telling about things that are happening in the lives of the characters. Rather, the characters will reveal themselves and the situation in which, in which they are by means of dialogue. With incidents arousing pity and fear. Now, in a tragedy, we must have these two uh, emotions uh, aroused. One is that of pity. Pity because such a noble being, the tragic hero, the heroic individual, suffers undeserved misfortune and uh, falls from a high station of life to a lower one. It is his downfall creates the sense of pity in our mind and fear, fear because we uh, when we see a great man falling in such a way, we feel fear that what can be the case if such things happen to us. So we uh, kind of uh, link ourselves, identify ourselves with the hero and put ourselves in their position, in uh, his position. And when we she at the end of the tragedy, the hero suffering the downfall, our emotions of pity and fear go through a process of catharsis. Catharsis means purgation. Purgation going out. Uh, be, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, say, term purgation actually means something going out and giving the feeling of relief. So he, in this case, the emotions and of pity and fear which are aroused are going out of our mind, giving us a sense of relief at the end of the tragedy. Because uh, we generally use self-pity too much. We feel pity for ourselves. But when we feel pity for another person, a person who is uh, other than us, then our pity is released. It is transformed from self-pity to pity for another person and our heart feels a sense of relief and that is the psychoanalytical effect of catharsis, the psychological effect of catharsis, which is, according to Aristotle, the final effect of a tragic play. Now, Aristotle uh, defined tragedy uh, with the help of the plays he had seen during his time. Later, tragedy developed in a number of ways. So let us first go into the uh, beginning of tragedy. Uh, in the 5th century BC, in the hands of the Greeks in Athens. So we can say that uh, the word tragedy uh, refers to a kind of play that uh, is, um, you can say, poses a serious question concerning the role of the man in the universe. Uh, somebody has raised a hand. I will uh, request her to wait for the end of the class because 
I am in a flow. Uh, I <clears throat> should answer your question later on if you write it down and ask it during the last five or ten minutes, which I will give you for question answer. Okay. Now, uh, so tragedy is a play that ends with a uh, cathartic effect which poses serious question concerning the role of man in the universe because we witness such a catastrophe at the end. The Greeks in Athens first used the word tragedy in the 5th century BC to uh, describe a specific kind of play which was presented at festivals or feasts of the Greek god Dionysus or Bacchus attended by the entire community. So the beginning of tragedy was religious. It was accompanied uh, or it was, it was uh, a kind of entertainment uh, which was presented at the festival of the Greek god Bacchus, the god of wine and fertility also. Such uh, festivals were attended by the entire community and uh, generally during the festival there were uh, tournaments, there were uh, uh, competition and tragedy writing was one such competition in which various playwrights took part. And in uh, the classical tragedies, the subject was the misfortunes of the heroes of legend, legendary heroes or mythical heroes or even historical heroes. And most of the material was derived from the works of Homer. And interestingly, uh, they were common uh, materials which were known to most of people in the Greek communities. So, uh, and, uh, it was uh, on, the, on the twists and turns of the events or the plot that the chief entertainment uh, depended because the theme was more or less known to them. We come to know about three great Greek tragedy writers who are Ascylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. Ascylus was uh, born in 525 BC and died in 456 BC. Sophocles uh, was born in 496 and died in 406 BC. Euripides was born in 480 and died in for, uh, 406 BC. So they, are, they were more or less contemporaries. And their plays made the uh, tragedy writing so popular and uh, so enduring that tragedy as a literary genre proved its viability through 25 centuries. And even today, tragedy is being written with uh, so much potential. Um, now, if we think historically, we shall find that there are four ages or four periods in the history of literature in which tragedy flourished and achieved a great stature. It uh, 
achieved the pinnacle of success. Uh, these four periods belong to the history of four different countries or cultures. First, we have already said that tragedy flourished in the hands of the playwrights of Athens in Greece in the 5th century BC. Then we have the great age of tragedy in England in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I and James I, that is in the Renaissance period. We can say that uh, great tragedy in English flourished between 1558 to 1625, that is in the Elizabethan and the Jacobian period. Now 17th century France had seen another great age of tragedy writing. And later in the modern period, uh, Europe and America uh, saw a great rise of tragedy, especially in the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. So these are the four great ages of tragedy writing. In England, now we are coming to the history of English literature. In England, tragedy was uh, shaped by not the classical, not the um, uh, Greek dramatists like uh, Sophocles or Euripides, but the first English tragedy was shaped on the models of Seneca, the revenge tragedy writer from Rome, a playwright who mostly wrote revenge tragedies. So when the first English tragedy appeared, it was obviously a revenge tragedy, that is a tragedy whose main theme is the hero's endeavor to take revenge for some wrong done to him, especially the murder of a near and dear one. Great tra tragedies are written in this mode in England. And if we, if, if, uh, if we uh, think of the greatest tragedy written in this mode, it is perhaps Hamlet by Shakespeare. Anyway, the first English tragedy appeared in 1561. It was uh, written by Thomas Norton and Thomas Shatville. The name of the play, the sorry, the title of the play was Gorgoduck. It uh, was a Shenikan revenge tragedy and its introduction was very important because after Gorbudak was written, the, in, the style of English drama completely changed from morality and mystery plays to the writing of tragedies in the Elizabethan era. Now, <clears throat> we find a number of great dramatists who wrote before the greatest came to the stage, William Shakespeare. So they are called pre-Shakespearean dramatists. They are otherwise known as the university wits because they belonged, at least most of them belonged uh, either to the Cambridge or the Oxford University. And among the university wits, the greatest is uh, Christopher Marlowe, whose uh, Edward II was in your syllabus. But uh, as your syllabus is being curtailed for this session, you don't have to uh, study Edward II, but Macbeth is still in your syllabus. So, after uh, the uh, 
pre-university, uh, pre-Shakespearean dramatists or the university wits wrote their plays and popularized tragedy on the English stage. Shakespeare came and took it to another height. And after Shakespeare, there are other writers who are called post-Shakespearean dramatists who continued writing in this mode uh, throughout the Jacobian period. But uh, we must understand that there is some crucial differences between the tragedies of the classical era, the Greek tragedies, and the Renaissance tragedies written by Shakespeare and other notable dramatists. Now I shall come to these differences, which are uh, very uh, important to understand in order to appreciate the Renaissance tragedies, including Shakespeare's Macbeth. Uh, as the Greek developed tragedy, such plays raise, raised questions about the human existence. Why must humans suffer? Why do we suffer in this world? Why must we are always torn between the shimming in irreconcilable forces of good and evil, fate and free will, truth and deceit. So these are such certain binaries on the uh, contradictions, on the conflict of which the theme of tragedy is based, the conflict between good and evil, good and evil both outs outside and also in the human heart, within the human heart, truth and deceit, fate and free will. So that is very important, fate, whether it is uh, fate or destiny that dictates our life or whether we have free will, we have our own will to uh, dictate the terms of our life. That is very important in case of tragedy. And tragedy tries to find whether the causes of such sufferings are external and dependent on blind chance. The evil designs of others or the malice of the gods or whether its causes are internal and one brings suffering upon oneself through his own faults like arrogance, infatuation, or the tendency to overreach. Now that is a crucial difference between the uh, classical tragedy and the Renaissance tragedy. How far a tragic protagonist is responsible for his tragic downfall, for the, for the catastrophe at the end. Now, the Greeks believed that destiny is supreme in dictating the terms of our life. That is, our lives are guided by fate altogether. And though the hero makes a mistake, it is actually an error of judgment that he makes, but it is ultimately the cruelty of destiny that causes his downfall. If you think of uh, Sophocles' Oedipus the king, you will find that Oedipus commits certain grave mistakes, certain serious offenses, but these are not done knowingly. These were unintentional. Oedipus unknowingly murders his father 
and marries his mother. This was dictated by fate even before Oedipus was born. That Oedipus would commit certain heinous crimes or certain uh, grave or serious mistakes were uh, told by the oracles even before the birth of Oedipus. So Oedipus tries his whole life to avoid that destiny. His father and mother tries, tried to avoid this destiny. Oedipus himself tried to avoid this destiny, but the inexorable fate actually ultimately proves fatal instead of all the efforts made by human beings. So fate or destiny reigns supreme in case of classical tragedies. But because Renesha uh, literature and Renesha culture is based on humanistic philosophy, it gives agency to human beings in shaping the course of their life. So in case of Renesha tragedy, it is often the tragic flaw of an individual that is responsible for his downfall. Often the hero is uh, suffering from a moral flaw. In case of classical tragedies, the hero suffered from an error of judgment. But in case of Renaissance tragedies, it is not hamarsia or error of judgment, rather it is a tragic flaw or moral flaw which causes the hero's fall. The hero may be arrogant, may be jealous, may be uh, over ambitious, may have a tendency to overreach himself. So these are flaws that caused or that causes, uh, cause the downfall of the hero in a renaissance tragedy. So in a very beautiful uh, phrase, this is summarized as destiny is character and character is destiny. In case of classical tragedy, destiny is character. Destiny itself is a character that uh, almost uh, rules the life of human beings. In case of renaissance tragedies, character is destiny. It is the character of a protagonist that dictates his fate and uh, takes him to the way he goes. This is an uh, important and crucial difference between the classical and the Renaissance or Elizabethan tragedies. Now, uh, another important uh, uh, you can say a distinction between Elizabethan and classical tragedy is that uh, in uh, classical tragedies, generally unities, three unities were maintained at least to a certain extent. Uh, it, is, it was Aristotle who told us about the three unities, the unities of time, place and action, though uh, he did not put too much emphasis on it, especially on the uh, unities of time and place. place. But uh, obviously time, uh, uh, the unity of action is very necessary in the classical tragedies because Aristotle said that uh, tragedy must be complete in itself. So an action which is serious and complete in itself must be the theme of a tragedy. Uh, so if uh, we take that particular part of the Aristotelian definition of tragedy, then we shall understand that the action should be a continuous whole. 
there must be a unity within the action that Aristotle prescribes. Later on, the uh, French tragedy writers, the French classicists, uh, had given uh, too much emphasis on the unity of time and place also. They said that tragedy must be complete within the uh, the action of the tragedy must be complete within a single day. Uh, that is a single rotation of the sun. They believed that the uh, sun actually moves over the earth, so moves sorry moves around the earth. So they they uh, actually uh, said that it should be completed. The action of the tragedy should be completed within one rotation of the sun, that means one day, and the place must be that the local must be the same. The local of the action must be the same. So this is uh, a very uh, rigorous discipline imposed on the tragedy writer because he must write a kind of tragedy that should be very uh, keen to imitate the reality. It must be written, the, the action must be completed within a single day, the place of the action should be a particular locale or place, and the action must be complete in itself. Now, Renaissance tragedy uh, differs from this in a number of ways. First of all, there are a number of subplots in uh, Renaissance tragedies. Subplots means plots which are associated to the main plot. So naturally, there is no singleness of action or unity of action which was prescribed in the classical tragedies. Often they mix tragedy and comedy. There are comic scenes or comic relief inside a tragedy. There are a number of instances in Macbeth also, which was not allowed in uh, classical tragedy because classical tragedy was defined as the imitation of an action that is serious. So there was no place for comic relief. Interestingly, uh, in classical tragedies, uh, chorus played a very important role. Uh, the chorus played the role of the commentator, the intro uh, introducing the theme of the play and commenting on it from time to time in order to reveal certain things to the audience, which even the characters may not know. Uh, there are no chorus in the true sense of the term in Renaissance tragedies. And in classical tragedies, violent scenes were not presented on stage. In uh, Renaissance tragedies, there are numerous violent scenes, which, horrible scenes, which were presented on stage, even murders. So uh, these are certain important differences that we find in classical and Renaissance tragedy. Uh, so I was talking about Hamarsia, the tragic flaw. In case of Greek tragedy or um, classical tragedy, this Hamarsia or tragic flaw was mainly the hero's lack of self-knowledge or lack of judgment that brings about his downfall from prosperity to adversity. An important form of Hamarsia in Greek tragedy is hubris, that is pride. The hero's pride in his own abilities and uh, uh, pride that he is almost as uh, powerful as a god. So, in case of a classical tragic hero, it is his hubris that is excessive pride and ego that 
the uh, that uh, actually uh, makes him overstep the human limitations and brings about his tragic downfall. In case of Renaissance tragedy, uh, it is generally an apparent weakness in the hero's character that causes his downfall. If we if we uh, uh, see the uh, Shakespearean plays, especially the great four tragedies written by Shakespeare, Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, and uh, Othello. In all those, we shall find a moral flaw in the hero. In Macbeth, it is over ambition. In Othello, it is jealousy. In uh, King Lear, it is irascibleness of, temp of temper. And in Hamlet, it is irresolution or his procrastination that causes his downfall. So these are almost moral flaws. Fate plays a role, but that is not a, a dictating role. In case of Macbeth also, there are certain situations that provoke Macbeth and uh, you can say, make him th do things which he otherwise would not do, even for his moral weakness. So uh, situation or uh, coincidences, or you can say fate, play a certain role, but they are not dictating the hero's actions in the same way as they do in the classical tragedy. So let us uh, stop our discussion here. And the next day, we shall go into uh, the text of Macbeth after uh, having a discussion on Shakespeare and his plays. So uh, I shall stop my discussion here. Uh, and now I will give you time to ask your questions one by one. Please tell your names and then ask your question. Thank you.